Hello, and welcome to the World Wanderers Podcast, a proud part of the Wander Barn Podcast Network. I'm Ryan. I'm Amanda. And we're your hosts. We're a traveling couple and digital nomads taking you on our adventures as we explore locations, destinations, and careers. Enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of the World Wanderers podcast. We are super excited to be back with the podcast in 2023 and bringing you some brand new content. And we are very excited to be sharing this interview with you here today. We are joined by Mark Walters. Mark is a PhD professor of marketing, a professional traveler, and a YouTuber. He shares his worldly experiences with over 3 million loyal Walters World followers every month, and he has made it his mission to share wholesome, honest travel and culture. Culture advice. And so this week on the show, Mark shares how he fell in love with travel, a bit of his travel story and journey, how he's balanced travel with working full time as a marketing professor, his journey with creating videos on YouTube, uh, some of his favorite places, a few overrated places in his opinion and ours, and much more. So this is a really, really fun conversation. Mark has a lot of really great stuff to share. So we're super excited to get into it. So without further ado, here is Mark. Welcome to the podcast today, Mark. We're really excited to have you here with us today. Thanks, Amanda. I'm glad you guys invited me. Yeah, we are stoked to chat with you. I think we're going to have a really awesome conversation. And one of the things we always like to start with is just asking, where in the world are you joining us from today? Right now, I am joining you from beautiful, sunny Champaign, Illinois, near the campus of the University of Illinois, where I actually have my day job and it's finals week. So I am grading exams between uh, talking to you and planning another trip. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I was I was really kind of curious just about you when I was reading your bio and stuff and learning about you. I was like, oh, it's like a, you know, PhD professor works in marketing and also has like a massive YouTube channel about travel. And then you've got so many interesting kind of not typical videos on your YouTube channel. So you've definitely got a really, you know, interesting blend of passions. And we're excited to dive into that. I'm curious, maybe we can start with the travel side of things and just hear a little bit about, you know, your travel story, you know, where your passion and love for travel came from. Sure. Well, my passion for travel, you know, some people started traveling when they were younger. My my entire childhood, our vacations were going from Western Illinois to Western Ohio, and that was it. So I never really traveled abroad ever, though my my dad worked abroad, but I never traveled as a kid. And then I started to study abroad because it sounded cool. So I studied abroad in high school a couple of times, a couple of times in college. I have a master's in Germany, I did my PhD in Portugal. And over the years, I've just become so impassioned about traveling that it really became a part of my life. And so no matter where I've been, whether I've been a broke student or a professor, it's just travels become part of me. And and uh, the, the traveling started with just a, a simple study abroad to Australia that opened my mind. To, wow, there's a whole world out there that I want to explore. And 16 year old me has been doing that since the last 30 years. That gives you a hint of how old I am now <laughs> to just kind of see everything. And over the years, I've been very lucky to like be able to integrate my family into this, my work into this, meet wonderful people like you and Ryan that also love traveling. And it's just been a, it's been a wonderful experience. Yeah, that's really awesome. And so you find this like love for travel kind of while you're studying. And then, you know, did you did you start your career kind of right away? And, and how did travel kind of play into that? Well, Actually, the my passion for travel influenced my career choices because when I was, I mean, I studied abroad, like I said, in college and high school. And, and when I was finishing college, I really wanted to show companies that were that I was like truly international. So I decided to do my master's degree not in the US, but abroad. So that kind of the the, the passion to like see the world drew me into my my master's. And then the same kind of thing drew me into my PhD. And but between my PhD and my master's, I actually ended up volunteer teaching because I, you know, they always talk about have your dreams in your back pocket. And and so one of my dreams was like I wanted to teach, but I also wanted to work in Eastern Europe. And so this opportunity came to teach in Lithuania as a volunteer at a business school. And they're like, oh, do you have a master's degree in a business field? Would you like to volunteer and teach? I'm like, it sounds like a great opportunity. So I get to travel and teach. And that was such a great experience. I ended up living there for three and a half years, teaching and working and all kinds of stuff. And I realized this is what I love and I want to keep doing this, but I want to keep traveling. So then I ended up teaching in Brazil for a while. And then I found, I got into a PhD program in Portugal. And so that, that keep traveling around really kind of stuck with me. So I got to keep the travel and the teaching going at the same time. And now I've been, this is my 12th year at the University of Illinois, um, Geese College of Business. And 
and uh, having a great time with it. And uh, I still get to travel quite often because of how school settings are work. I get to take students around the world. So it's really a fantastic kind of blend of everything together, which is what you know digital nomads like love to do is getting life and, and travel together. And sometimes you can do it and still have the day job too. Yeah, definitely. I know, I think some of our first adventures where we were meeting people who were able to kind of build in travel into the lifestyle was people who were doing um, teaching abroad. Like we had one person in specific who was like teaching in different schools around the world and would just have his his summers to go on these big, crazy adventures. So I think definitely cool. For you, when you did your master's, did you do that in Europe? Yeah, I did my master's in Germany. I was in Berlin for two and a half years. Okay, cool. And so, yeah, I know you had mentioned that like having that interest in going to Eastern Europe, where did that kind of curiosity come from? You know, it was one of those things. I remember back when the wall fell, when I was, I was a kid at the time, I still remember like on the bus going to school and they're like, the, the Berlin wall has fallen. I'm like, that's so cool. And then they had the, the hands across, you know, the Baltics and Lithuanian stuff. And I remember the Lithuanians being the first ones to try to push away the Soviets. So it kind of stuck in my mind. And so when I saw this opportunity, I'm like, yeah, I want to go meet, I want to go live there. I want to get more experiences there. And I had traveled in Eastern Europe and that was kind of like, got me interested, but I'm like, you know what? I want to go there and I want to try to make a difference. And, and that kind of drove me that way because, I mean, it was the early 2000s when I was there. I mean, we were only like, you know, 10, 15 years since the fall of communism. And that's a whole different ball game. So it was really cool to teach because I had like the younger generation who grew up with English in school and a very different mentality versus older people. Like I was teaching 40 year olds marketing who grew up in the Soviet system. And so it was like, Hey, there's a whole, like you're teaching marketing at a whole different level at these two different generations. It was really a fantastic experience. Yeah. And what, what were some of the things that stood out for you as like kind of someone in their twenties, younger, um, used to growing up in the States and then like actually living for a couple of years in Lithuania. What were like some of the things that really stood out to you? Uh, one of the big things was uh, you didn't get control when the heating came on. The The heating would only come on when like the average temperature was like a certain degree three days in a row. So you could literally have like bitter cold weather two days in a row. Then the third day, oh, it's a heat snap. It's like 45 degrees, you know, or like 10 Celsius. Oh no, we're not going to turn it on. And you could have that. And I remember sometimes there would be ice like my, I, one of those, you know, when you think of the old Soviet, like apartment buildings, like the, just the cement up, I lived in one of those and the ice would form inside over my, like my heater had like a shelf over the top of it. And the ice would form over that. I just remember like sleeping like some nights with the blankets all over me. I'd wake up in the morning and I would just like be in tears. I'm like, I don't want to get out of bed because if I moved, the cold air would come in my sheets and I'm like, Oh, Oh. But it was a brisk way to wake up every day, but it was, it was very different living experience. Um, but I, I did enjoy it, you know, and, and I was lucky because, you know, when I was in school, I lived in Argentina and my dad had worked in Mexico. So I went down there for, for the, like the travel from Mexico was for my dad's work vacation there that happened, but like the family vacations were Ohio, but it was just one of those things you really start to see. It's like, it's a very different world out there, but no matter where I lived, like you still have this, like people still were pretty similar. Like we all want to have a better life for our kids. We want to you know, do well for ourselves. We want to have you know, a safe life and eat well and have a full tummy and spend time with friends. So it was kind of a cool thing to see that all those years that we were here and like, oh, the Soviets are so different than us. No, the people that were in the former Soviet Union were, were good people too. And so it was really, really eye-opening experience for me. Yeah. And I can see where the motivation to uh, get down to Brazil came from as well. Yes. Yes. That was actually, uh, I ended up in Brazil because I remember I got out of the gym and it was like in December in Lithuania and it was freezing cold outside. And as any good gym should, there was a bar upstairs. And so I was in the bar having maybe a beer or two. And I was like on ICQ, like that's how long it was. ICQ with a friend of mine in Brazil. He's like, what are you doing? I'm going to the beach and you're freezing. Come to Brazil. And I, you know, I was three big beers in. I'm like, you know what? That sounds like a good idea. And literally, I bought the tickets right then to go for the next year. Wrote my bosses saying, this is my last semester. I'm going to leave, you know, and because of how the contracts work, it wasn't a big deal. So I finished off the semester, came back to the U.S., got myself, then went to Brazil. Wow, that's amazing. And I'm curious, you know, how easy it is, is it to find these teaching jobs? What is it like to apply for them? I know you just mentioned contracts. So I'm, I'm guessing you have some sort of like commitment in terms of like, I'll be here one year, two years, one semester, et cetera. Like how does all of that work? Well, 
here's the thing. If you have advanced degrees, it's a lot easier to get um, like visas and things like that. I know what's cool now is you have a lot of those digital nomad visas you can get for a year or two to stay in places, which is awesome, which I really wish they had back in the day. Uh, but if you have an advanced degree, that opens a lot of doors. Like I have a PhD, so I have a PhD, master's, all those things. So it's kind of like, oh, Dr. Walters, you, 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 we, we want hired, like it's one of those things. They want, you know, people coming in that can work that way. Because it because a lot of places, what you have to realize, they have to prove why they cannot hire a local versus someone that's not from there. So having the advanced degree makes it easier. Or if you go get your TOEFL uh, certificates, like you have the certificate showing that, look, I have been trained to do that. That's going to make it easier. But if you're looking for the jobs, like there's the, the teaching English, there are there are places all over the world. Like I know people that are from the U.S. that live in Greece, but they got a job in Ireland to teach English because there's such a demand for that in certain locations that that can be a really great way. A lot of really good people I know like went to Korea and Japan to go teach English. And a lot of those like professional schools have it set up that they bring you in. They give you a place to stay. So that can be a really good kind of like first step into going to live abroad because it's kind of like they hold your hand to get you there and get you set up. And then while you're there, you kind of, you know, like bloom yourself in your international travels. That's one thing to do. Um, if you're looking for more of like university stuff, because I've always taught at universities. Um, like you want to look at different programs they have. What can you offer? And if it's universities, you're going to have to have, you know, like master's level degree or PhD level degree for a, a lot of places, especially in Europe, because it's just required. Because they're like, look, you don't have an advanced degree. We can find someone else that has those experiences. So that is something to think about in terms of what do you want to teach and how do you want to teach? Um, so that can be a thing to kind of look at. Um, in terms of the application for it, one thing you have to realize is if you're going to be traveling around and trying to get um, jobs. Make sure you have all of your degrees, uh, your TEFL certificates, your your bachelor's degree, your master's degree. Have scanned copies of that, like in a Google file, a Google folder for you, so you have it. Because you're going to need to have some of those for the application processes. I know for Germany, I actually had to have my mom mail me my bachelor's degree from the U.S. so they could photocopy it and then put a stamp on the photocopy, saying, "Okay, now this photocopy is just as real as your real degree." And I'm like. Okay, but it is one of those kind of funny things that are out there. Uh, but that's one thing. Um, also, if you're going to go teach abroad um, and you, you're a couple, um, if you're not married, some places will not help you get that that visa for your, your spouse or your partner. Um, so that's a kind of an important thing with family members, like your kids can get it for like easily. Like I went where I was doing my PhD, my, my oldest came and, you know, he was, you know, three and I mean, it was literally like he and I got our visas same day. My wife, it took her 13 months to get her first 12 month visa. We actually picked it up. It was already expired for a month, but they still printed it. And she got her visa, like her the card, and she got it that morning to turn it back in that afternoon for her next 12 month visa. So the, the headaches can be, uh, they can be out there. So be ready for, uh, be ready for a lot of um, smiling and, and, gritting your teeth sometimes with some of the uh, bureaucracy that's out there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Thanks for that thorough explanation of that. That's really great information. And yeah, I can imagine that there's, you know, just some planning and whatnot that needs to go into it. It's not just as simple as like, Hey, I want to teach here starting September. It's July. I'm just going to move there. I'm sure you have to plan a little bit more and make sure all your ducks are in a row and stuff like that. So yeah, super interesting to hear about. And I'm curious, you know, at what point did you get interested in in YouTube and think about like, hey, I might, I, I'd like to start a YouTube channel. So I started making YouTube videos on uh, 2007, 2008, and uh, I made videos like my fian my wife now, but my fiance at the time, she was coming to move to Portugal to to live with me. So I wanted to get her ready. I want to teach her some Portuguese. I wanted to like have, let her know where we're going to be living and like the grocery store. So I'd like do a video on. Here's some of the uh, Portuguese word for food. And I walked around our local store, like showing her the food and the, this kind of stuff. So I started making those videos. But also, as I was teaching at the time, I was teaching in Portugal and, and you know, I had a lot of non-native English speakers as my students. So I started making summary videos of the content from the class so they could study like a, a study guide, you know. And so I started making videos that way. And I was making the videos for years. It was actually kind of like my hobby. So I had my Walters World, which is our travel channel. I've got Professor Walters, which is our business channel. You know, we I did she, or my marketing videos are on there. And I was just, you know, I was putting them out and it was like three or four years before we actually made any money or like monetized anything. 
it was just a fun thing to do. And I saw how much it helped my students. So it was kind of like it grew and grew. And then it was like, oh, hey, you want to make some money on this too? I'm like, uh, yes, please. And so that kind of that kind of changed things a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And and I want to dive a little bit more into to that process. But before we fully go there, um, so I know you, you mentioned, so you went to uh, Germany and then to Lithuania and Brazil and to Portugal. And I know you mentioned being back in the States now for, for 12 years. At that point, when you were kind of, you know, doing that long stretch internationally, did you ever see yourself going back and, and living full time in the States? Were you thinking like, hey, I'm going to be keep doing this forever? Or, or what was kind of your mindset at that point? Well, I was actually okay with either way. I mean, I spent 12 years living abroad. I lived in South America before that. So it was like a nice, nice mix of stuff. And I just really enjoyed it. But I, I was, I mean, I know there's some people like, I'll never go back. I'm like, I never say that. You never, you never say never. Um, like my wife and I still talk like once our kids are, you know, out at, like now that they're, you know, they're high school. So like one's a wrestler and one's on the tennis team. You're like, I want them to have that stability of having those, that time with a group of people. But I know once, once our 11 year old is out of school, we're gone. Like we're, we'll be living abroad again, full time versus just half the year abroad, <laughs> you know? Um, but I don't know, like before I had a family, I probably saw myself living abroad forever. And then once I had a family, you know, I want, you know, I want the grandparents to see them occasionally, you know, not all the time, but you know, I see them sometimes. And then as your parents get older, you're like, you know, my, my parents are in their late seventies. And you know, it's like, I, I want to be there for them because, you know, my, my mom needs help. My dad needs help. You know, things kind of change your priorities in life change. And that's why it's very easy to be a digital nomad when you're young or when you're very old, because when you're very old, all my kids are growing up. I don't have to worry about them. So it's kind of interesting how you see like a, like a, like if you look on one of those charts, you see like when people age versus when they are digital nomads, you'll see there's kind of like two humps. So it's kind of funny. Um, but yeah, no, I, I mean, I mean, if I wouldn't have married an American woman, it probably would have probably would probably would have stayed abroad longer. But I think we would have come back to the U.S. eventually and then gone to brag again. I mean, I ended up having a real I have a really good job here at the University of Illinois and it's gone very well. So if it was if it wasn't this wasn't going so well. We, we'd have no problem packing up and going back to wherever. Yeah. And then was there a bit of like a reverse culture shock coming back and living full time in the States? Yes. Yes, actually it was. It was amazing because I left full time in 98 it was the last time I like lived full time in the U.S. And I came back in 2011 and I was just amazed like how things had changed and how people like like in the nineties, like anybody could talk politics, anybody could talk, and like everybody got along. And all of a sudden it was like, people weren't getting along as much as they used to. It's really kind of a, a surprising change. And then like dealing with the family, of course I was older. So dealing with your family and stuff, that was one thing, but it wasn't, it wasn't a uh, horrible, it wasn't as big as like culture shocks that I've seen people have when they go abroad, but it was one of those things to readjust to it. Um, and, you know, you focus on the positive and, and it helps you get through it. But yeah, there was some, there was a little reverse culture shock. We came back, but I'm like, my goodness, all these things are so much more expensive. Like, why did life get so much more complicated when I came back to the U.S.? Why? Why I went to the doctor's office? Why? Why do I have 19 bills? What's going on here? You know. So that was kind of that was kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah, I imagine too. That's like such a big time of change as well. Just like business change, technology changing. Um, we have some good friends who we, we live in central Mexico and have some good friends here who just moved back to the Chicago area. And so I know for them, it's, it's been a uh, shock the weather wise, at least weather and price wise, I think is my understanding. They've been a little shocked by, you know, sticker shock and then, you know, climate shock. Cause they've been living in Mexico for four years. And so you know, they just moved back and it's the beginning of December at the time of recording. So I, I, I would have moved back like in April. <laughs> I know. Right. Yeah. That was, well, that was actually their, their plan was to move after the kids finished school, but they found like the house of their dreams and it just didn't make sense. Like once they closed on the house to keep a house empty there and to have a house here. So makes sense. Yeah. It does make sense when you, when you know that detail, otherwise you're like, why on earth would you move there? <laughs> like right at the start of winter, like you got a long. Most like make sure they're gone for the winter in Chicago. Take my word for it; it's not fun. I'm two hours from Chicago. I don't go there in the winter. It's too cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, a hundred percent. And so, Mark, as you kind of you guys kind of adapted to life back in the states, and also like starting a family, how did that affect like the travel and adventure part of life? 
Actually, it, we actually traveled more with kids. Like this is one thing. We are very big proponents of travel with children because a lot of people, I mean, you'll see it on Instagram or TikTok, like people have a kid and they'll hold up their passport. With like the baby next, baby's there and they'll have like a match or a lighter next to their passport. They're like, might as well burn this down. I'm like you are the dumbest people I know. Trying with kids is so easy to do, especially when they're little. Like you got a 10 month old at the time of recording and they're, they're, you, you have the food with you all the time and you just carry them around and they're fine. It's tough when they're starting to walk. That's that's the tough part. When they're walking around, that's the tough part. But traveling with kids just makes traveling so much better. And some people say, oh, well, they don't appreciate it. I'm like, you know what? My, my youngest, he doesn't remember learning to walk in Paris. But you know what? I remember him learning to walk in front of the Louvre. And that means something to me. And so traveling with your kids just makes everything better. And now, I mean, I've, my, my oldest is 16 and my youngest is 11. And we've been, my youngest was born in Portugal. And we've been traveling their entire lives. And so now when I travel on my own, I like it sad. I'm like, I wish the kids were here. I wish my wife were here. I'm like, that darn school that kids have to go to, why can't I take them with me? I mean, it's really kind of funny because my wife, like I'll call like on the third day I'm gone. She's like, you miss us, don't you? I'm like, no, no, I don't miss you guys at all. You know, but it's obviously I do. But honestly, that's what I say. So if you can take your kids with you, take your family with you, it makes every destination better. Yeah, that's awesome not, to hear. Maybe not Las Vegas, but pretty much every other destination. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. We might not go to Vegas right now with a baby. <laughs> she might not be super fun there, but yeah, that's that's kind of been our philosophy, you know, as as we've had Lou and kind of stepped into this new chapter of life is like, we also want her to just get used to things. Like we started with, while we were waiting for her passports, we started with just road trips because we wanted her to be comfortable in her car seat and in the car and and that type of thing. And then, okay, now we can start you know, traveling, we started with shorter flights and we'll do our first big long haul flight with her in a couple of months. So cool. yeah. Yeah. That's been, been our philosophy too, is just like start her young. And I don't know. I mean, kids are so impressionable when they're this young, like maybe she's not going to have conscious memories of it, but it's certainly affecting her and how she's learning and growing. Yeah. And what, what's interesting is like my 11 year old, he'll mention stuff from when we were we spent a whole, I was teaching in China for a summer. And so like I would work Monday through Thursday all day, but my wife and my sons would go explore Beijing or other cities around China. And it was been really like eight or nine weeks. And, you know, he was, I think he had just turned two and he'll still to this day, will like mention stuff from China. I'm like, do you remember that? I thought you didn't remember after two, but there's like things he remember or like, we'll go to a restaurant and be like, this is good. But remember when we were in Tianjin, I'm like, you remember Tianjin? Like it just blows your mind the stuff that kids do remember. But what's cool is when you take your kids around, you're opening their their eyes and they see all these different things. They start to appreciate things a bit more. Like my my oldest one, you know, they you might not realize they notice it, but my oldest is 16. Yeah, you know, he'll he'll make a comment like, you know, we really were lucky to do all those things. Like he saw like he's seen abject poverty in places in Africa and South America. And then he's you know comes back home, there's a little more appreciation for what he has here. So that's been kind of a cool thing. Yeah, I feel like too, it probably just makes them feel a lot more comfortable, even though they might not have as many conscious memories of the adventures. The fact that they've been on planes and like been new places, like they're going to feel a level of comfort with that that they wouldn't if it was the first time it ever happened. Yeah. And that's why it's always important if you like you guys are doing, start them young and then they're used to being good travelers. Yeah, you know, we. I'm sure you'll you'll get this because I know you'll be traveling with Lou. Is people will see you with a kid and then their eyes will like squint down, like I hate you. You're traveling with babies on a plane, and we would get people like would be loudly commenting how they don't like to sit by children on planes and why do people let children on planes? Like really rude stuff. I'm like, we can hear you. And at the end of, of course, our, our kids, you know, they travel a lot. They got their headphones. They're watching their movies, playing their games. They get off the plane. That person's been making a fuss about kids the whole time. They get up and say, oh, your kids have been acting so well. And we're like, yeah, I wish you could have asked that well, too. It was like the kids sometimes are better than some of the, uh, you know, the the other passengers on there. So, yeah. But once the kids get used to it, for them, it's the same thing. That's why it's really good. Like you're you're going, doing your road trips in the car seat and you can use the car seat on the plane. Then it's totally a comfortable adventure for them. They know no different. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I, I just took Lou on a, a solo adventure. So it's just me and her and she's pretty grabby right now. She's just very curious and everything. So, oh, yeah. you know, I just had to let my neighbors know beside me on the plane. Like, I'm really sorry if she like, you know, touches you or anything like that. And people were really kind. And at the end of one flight, the guy behind me kind of peered forward and he's like, 
I was a little nervous when I saw you sit down with that baby, but she flew really well. <laughs> I was like, yeah, thanks. <laughs> he was super kind about it, but yeah, I think it is, it is, you can be like, a, it is a little nerve wracking when you're that parent that walks on the plane with, you know, all your stuff and you're like small child and you can see the people around you just kind of, you know, giving you a side eye and that type of thing. But yeah, I don't know. I think that lots of kids do really great on planes. Yeah. And some kids don't, but I think one thing you have to realize is when people get mad at kids, they're not usually mad at the kids. They're usually mad at the parents because it's the parents that aren't doing anything. You know, if the kids running up and down the aisles, that's the parent. Like you, the, that's not safe for the kid. That's not safe for anybody around there. You know, the flight attendants aren't the babysitters, but I'll see people that literally like they will do nothing with their kid. They'll just let the kid do whatever. I'm like, you can't do that on a plane. Those are the kind of kids. It's not the kid's fault. It's the parents that people should hate. You know, they're mad at those kids for doing all that. As long as a parent is trying, you can't be upset. Like they're trying. Kids are kids. Yeah, there's there's adults that are worse, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Also, we were just having a conversation with someone a while ago about how it's weird on airlines where they don't just like put all the like, oh, you're traveling with like a small child. We're going to put you in this like part of the plane where like all the small children are going to be. Um, it seems like the type of thing that would be helpful where people who really didn't like kids could sit on the end farther away from kids. Um, but sometimes it's like airlines just kind of give you random seats anyways and sh shove a kid in between two other people and all that type yeah, of stuff. Well, and that's one of the things I think some uh, they, I've seen articles where people say, oh, I flew with my small child and that airline didn't put me together. This is one of those things. If you're going to fly with your kid, pay the money to get the seat reservations so you can sit with your kids or buy the tickets that are like that. Because a lot of the times when people have those issues, it's because they didn't pay for the seat reservation. They just hope that on the day of thing, there's going to be three seats next to each other, which doesn't always happen. Now, if your flight gets delayed or you get you know, switched to another flight, then that does happen. Like our youngest, I mean, he's flown with people from France over because we like our plane got delayed. They had three middle seats to get us back. So he sat next to a dude and talked to him about his time in France. And I was like three seats back. My wife was on the other side. Because there was you had no choice and there's the people wouldn't give it up and that that does happen sometimes but i think it's important to buy the tickets and buy the seat reservations so you are together because then if things happen well at least we did the best we could because there's not as many people giving up their seats like they used to like i'll i'll give up my seat for a family so they can be together it's not a big deal for me when i'm traveling by myself but you know i know some people that are very adamant no i will never give up for people so that's why sometimes it's better to eliminate that possibility. You might not get to sit by your kid by making sure you book a seat if you can. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a good point. Um, and I know I kind of steered us a tiny bit away from, from YouTube, but you were talking about how you kind of just got started. It was a bit more of just like showing your girlfriend, you know, things about Portugal. Um, how did that evolve over time? And, and for you to kind of that thing becoming something that like, hey, I'm just doing it for fun becoming something where it's like, oh, wow, lots and lots of people are actually watching my videos. What was that experience like? It, it was interesting because like I, I made those videos and it was funny because like they got watched not just by her, but by other people. And it was funny because there was a lot of Germans that actually watched it. And so I started making videos in German, like learning Portuguese for German. And they actually did better than learning Portuguese for English speakers, right? And so then I started making learning Italian, learning Spanish in German for German speakers. And it was and as you know, things kind of evolved. I'm like, wow, a lot of people are watching these. That's kind of cool. But it wasn't until we made our first like Five Love and Hates video um, that really things kind of changed where it went from like, oh, you got some views to, oh, wait, that's a, that's a lot of views. What's going on here? You may remember this is before YouTube was everything. Um, and it was like, wow, people, people like this. And it was like one of the things I liked because I was like, look, people never talk about the truth of travel. They always give the fluff pieces. You know, it's like... Yeah, I mean, I, what I like about you all is you, you'll talk about the good and the bad about the being a digital nomad, not just making it seem like it's a perfect little world. And at the time, all the blogs, all the blogs, all the got, travel guidebooks were every place is great, every place is the new Paris, every place is the Venice of the east, south, west, north, whatever. I'm like, that's not true. And so that, like, that kind of thing kind of pushed me to try to make some more of these, like, truthful, you know, good and bad, so people were better prepared videos. And that really resonated with people. And so then I started making more and more. And then I, I was like, hey, there's different kind of areas in here. There's there's the don'ts of travel, you know, like things you don't want to do when you're there, but don't forget to do as well. So it's good and bad. But then there's like fun culture shocks you want to know about. And then like as time grew, I saw that, man, these are really helping people out. And so it became like, I really want to make the videos to help out other travelers or fellow travelers, as we call them in our, our videos. 
And it was amazing because I would think it was when we got to like 50,000 subs on YouTube. It was like, wow, like people are actually like really liking us. We were getting, you know, people were writing us and calling us and all kinds of stuff. And it was like, wow, we're really making a difference. You know, it was, it's when you start getting like normal everyday people who don't are not YouTube usual commenters, but they'll find you on social media and DM you. Like, I just want you to know I'm a family. It was my first time traveling with my kids and your videos really inspired us. It really helped. Just want to say thank you. They're like, man, that's awesome. I got to be a, I get to be a small part of people's travels, but it's a really cool thing. And, and as I've gone through the years, it's like, wow, we're just helping people. Like every place we go, it's like, now it's not just helping them go into the most popular places, but you know what? I think people should go to Nicaragua. I think people should go to Rwanda. Let's go there and show people what it's like, help educate them too. Cause sometimes when you're making travel content, it's not just about getting people to go there. It's helping people know if they don't want to go there too. So it's, it's been a kind of a, a crazy journey over the years. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. And I, I really, one of the things I really like about your brand and, and what you're doing is that you are talking about the truth of travel. And this is something, I mean, we've received like, honestly, like some hate from, from people about these things. Like, oh, it's like so inconsiderate of you that you like, don't think this is your favorite place. And I'm like, yeah, but like, there's places you don't like too, you know? And I, I do think that it's really important as anyone putting out travel content that we're keeping it real for people. And, you know, sometimes there are realities that are not glamorous. Actually, a lot of the times that's the case. And I think it's important that we are talking about that thing, that stuff. And and also, I feel like sometimes there's things that are like promoted as, hey, you should go do this in this city. And you go do it. And you're like, why is this popular? <laughs> like, why are, why are people saying we should do this? Like, people are just doing it because people keep saying we should do it. But this thing is actually not as amazing as maybe this other local market or restaurant, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think too with, with travel, people really want like for a lot of people, it's like I'm really invested in this being a great experience. And so sometimes it can be like, oh, I'm hearing the things that like aren't great about a place, um, which isn't the most fun thing. Um, but kind of speaking of that, just like looking through your YouTube channel, Mark, you've got so many different places on there from Russia to Rwanda, um, all around the world. And you mentioned kind of going to some of these places that maybe are a little bit more off the radar that people aren't choosing to go to as frequently. Um, what are some of the places like that for you, places that maybe aren't like, you know, the Paris's of the world um, that have been your favorite places that you would recommend people check out as someone who's done a lot more travel than the average person? Yeah, I think one, if you look like one of my passions, I love South America, I love Central America. And, you know, people get upset with this sometimes. You, we were talking about how you get like mean comments before and you're like, hey, this is reality. And people will get mad at us like, hey, why don't you have any videos on South America or Central America? I'm like, we literally have like 500 videos on South America. It's because people aren't usually looking for it. So therefore YouTube or Google doesn't show them those results or Instagram doesn't show you the results of beautiful South America because you're looking at Paris stuff all the time. And so when we go and look for places like, you know, like Nicaragua, like Granada, Nicaragua is just gorgeous. You go anywhere in Rwanda is fantastic to go to. Um, if you're looking at, you know, sometimes sometimes it is going to Europe, but not the Berlin's, Munich, or Paris. You go to a, you know, the Hartz Mountains in Germany, which is gorgeous, especially at Christmas time. And it's literally just, there's no international tourists. You know, like people are missing out on these things because, you know, it's easy. Like Paris will always pop up and London will always pop up, but sometimes you miss out on some of those other places. And so that's why we like to go to them. Like if you're going to, you know, people go to Brazil, they think, oh, I gotta go to Sao Paulo and Rio. Like actually as a tourist, there's no reason for you to go to Sao Paulo except to fly at the airport. And I live in Sao Paulo and I like Sao Paulo, but it's a great place to live because of work and food and shopping, but not for a tourist. You'd be better off going to Minas Gerais, that, that state of Brazil, so you can see Ouro Preto, which has all the colonial buildings, and you can go to, I uh, mean, you know, all, all the stuff around Minas, that entire state is fantastic. Or you go to Mato Grosso do Sul, so you can do all the eco tourism, like in Bonito, like those places people don't think about because they don't show up usually in the like the IG posts where it's like, oh, here's me with a picture with those wings behind me, or I love Austin and I got to wait in line for 10 hours to get that picture, or you know, Key West where it's the southernmost point buoy. Like if you don't have one of those, sometimes people think it doesn't matter because it doesn't show up on Instagram. And I think you were you were alluding to that, Amanda. It was really poignant. You're like, people see these things on IG, Instagram and think, oh, I have to go to the city because it's that. Morocco is a great example. Rather, the Shannon Cell, or not Shannon Cell, um, Charles Schroen, I can never say it right. The Blue City in Morocco, you saw all these Instagrammers go there, and it's cool because it's blue. But 
that's that. Like you're better off going to Marrakesh because there's more stuff to do there than going to the Blue City because, yeah, you take some pictures with some blue background. Uh huh. Like you want to enjoy more stuff, you're better off in Marrakesh. Yeah. And so you kind of think about those things. And I think one thing is Instagram and TikTok have really helped inspire people to travel and see new things. But they don't always, like you said, they don't always show all of it. So sometimes you're seeing this one beautiful picture, but there's nothing else to see there. And sometimes it's better to go to another town that doesn't have that beautiful picture, but you can totally get the culture. You know, like going to like places in, in Argentina or Chile, which, yeah, if you don't have the the gaucho there in Argentina, then it didn't really happen. Or you have the peaks of the Andes. Did you really see Chile? I'm like, yeah, you go to the north of Chile with the Atacama Desert. It's incredible. So there's all kinds of things out there. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing all of that. And I think we're very aligned with that as well. And I, I I went to Nashville a couple of years ago with with some girlfriends and I love Nashville. Like Nashville is one of my favorite cities in the US. I think it's super fun. I think there's lots of cool stuff you can do there. So definitely not hating on Nashville, but they have some of those wings there. And I know we were, we were just happened to be like shopping in that area and the line to get the photo was insane. Like it was definitely at least an hour, probably an hour and a half, maybe even two hours to get this photo that people post on social media. And I was just kind of like, there's so many cool things to do in the city and people are waiting in line just to get this photo. And it's kind of like, you know, why are people doing this? And it's like very much just social media. And I think it's so cool that social media has been able to encourage people to get out and encourage people to go see things. And, you know, it kind of gets like maybe these unheard of places on people's radar a little bit more, but then it's like, you know, I just feel like Nashville is this like bump in city. There's always live music. There's so much cool stuff to do. Like why on earth would you wait 90 minutes to get a photo with some angel wings? Like it's just beyond me. <laughs> oh yeah. And, and that's the exact angel wings I was talking about, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. You know them too. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, why, I'm like, why are you doing this? And here's, here's a fun tip people. If you just stand like 10 feet in front of those people that are getting the picture and you can position yourself and get that same picture yeah, there may be somebody behind you, but you can get basically the same picture and save yourself two hours. Like that's how I do all those things now. I'm just like the person that's taking the picture for that person. I stand kind of by like near them. And then my friend takes my picture and like, we're good. Let's go. And you'll see people in line getting all mad. You skipped the line. Like, no, I didn't. I took the picture 10 feet out. That, that, that lady is in my picture too. It's okay. You know, and it was like, and I saved myself two hours, you know, and Oh man, like and you'll see people get really mad if anybody tries to do things like like skip the light or whatever it does. It's like, why? Man? It's just some pain. It's pain on the wall. Yeah, for sure. That's like I was with a group of, you know, four other girlfriends and we kind of looked at each other and we were like, people are seriously waiting in this line for this photo. Like, I mean, if there had been no one there, like, would we have taken the photo? Yes, for sure. We probably would have taken it. But were we gonna wait in line for it? Absolutely not. Especially it's like you know, we had three days in Nashville, there's a million other things to do. But and and like you said, it is very interesting how just because it's been made famous on Instagram, people want it. And it's not even like historical, like we've also been to the Louvre. And, you know, there's a lot of people taking photos of the Mona Lisa, which is also a little bit, I'm a little bit like, there's a massive painting on the other wall that like nobody's taking a photo of that's like way more impressive. There is a painting right behind it is so much more impactful. Yeah. But at least like the Mona Lisa holds some historical significance. <laughs> it does. Not the way the wings in Nashville, not so much. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Do you have anything else on kind of your your list from your travels in terms of like don'ts? Like anything that you've done where you're kind of like, eh, maybe just skip it. There's other cool things that you can do in this area or other cities in this country you could see, kind of like you mentioned with Morocco. Yeah. Well, I think one. Because a lot of people go into Belgium and they hear Brussels all the time because it's the capital of the European Union. So they're expecting like D.C. capital, like lots of stuff and all these things and museums. And there's stuff in in in, in Brussels. But honestly, if you're going to be going to Belgium, don't go to Brussels. Go to Ghent, go to Antwerp, or especially go to Bruges. You'll get so much more out of it than going to this you know bureaucratic hub. And I think that's one of the things that you know we have to realize is when you're, you're traveling around, the, the cities that are famous, sometimes they're just famous because they're big. You know, it's like, yeah, it's got a million people. So yeah, people know the name, but is it really worth going to? Like people say, oh, I need to go to Frankfurt when I go to Germany. Like, no, you don't. 
it was wiped out in the war. They they rebuilt this one part. You're better off going to like on the one of the wine tours down or going down to Heidelberg. You'll get way more out of your German visit than, than doing Frankfurt. Or, you know, people they're like, oh, I'm going to Italy. I, I got to do Milan. I'm like, yeah, Milan's like a top 10 in Italy, but not like a top eight. You know, like you, you'd rather be going to Florence and, and Rome and, you know, the Bari and the Gazine Puglia and going to Venice and, and going to the, the Dolomites. And then yeah, eventually maybe Milan. But since they know Milan, well, Fashion Week and those things, like, look, that, it's cool. It's a great city to go out and party. But honestly, you're better off not going there and going to see another part of Italy because you'll get much more culture from there and have a good time. And it'll be a much more manageable thing versus the onslaught of millions of people that already live in Milan. Yeah. Yeah. Those are some good examples. I think I've been to Frankfurt and Milan. So I feel like I can second that in terms of Frankfurt is like a very business city and it's got some interesting stuff, but definitely not, you know, a place that I'll probably return to unless there's something specific I'm going to. And the cathedral in Milan, which is one of the things that's famous for is, is, I mean, it's stunning. It's beautiful. There's, you know, no denying that, but I think we went to Milan and we did that and a soccer game. I think that was pretty much all we did there. And we were like, okay, we're ready to move on. And would agree with you. We've been to a lot of places in Italy and we still have a lot of places we want to go. And Milan is not top of my list for places to return. Same here. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. (laughs) Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. I'm curious. So what's on your radar for 2023 and kind of beyond? Do you have some upcoming travel plans and plans for your YouTube channel, all that good stuff? Yeah. So our travel, it was funny how things were all planned, how COVID really, like it was like a, a, I, I like to call it like a, a stack of cards. You're like when they, they house the cards, you know, they build up and then COVID came in, all the cards fell. So now it's kind of like we're grabbing whichever card comes up that works. Right. So like next, like my next trip, I'm going to New York city to experience it during the holidays. And then I've got two weeks in England and Wales. And then my wife goes to Italy and France. And then she comes back and she's going to Arizona. I've got trips to San Francisco. We've got Israel, Jordan, Egypt, Portugal, Spain, um what else we have andorra a new country for me uh we got those are all that's all stuff like the first half of 2023 uh going farther afield um we're going to be because the last like 2021 we really spent going to see our friends again that we didn't get to see because of covid because a lot of our friends live around the world because we live around the world so it was like i'm going to go see alvi in lithuania i'm going to go to nando's wedding that's been put off for three years because of covid in italy you know it's like we're seeing all our friends and family around the world that was the last you know, year of travel. Now it's like, look, we're, we're, we're going to see a few more things, but we're really going to focus on going new places. So that's why now it's going to like, let's, let's really find places that we want to show people. Like you really should go here. You're missing out going here. Like that's why you know, Ethiopia is going to be on the list. We've got, you know, some stuff and some more stuff in Central America we're going to do uh, to show more like Honduras. And, and so like, there's a lot more, I guess I would say new places that we don't have videos from that we're going to be coming out with. Wow. Yeah. You, you have a lot of travel coming up, right? And I looked at each other like, Whoa, that's a lot of stuff. And so I'm, I'm just curious since you do have, you know, a day job and stuff, do you mostly do your travels kind of weekends, long weekends, breaks from school, that type of thing? All of them, all of them, <laughs> all of them, all of them you're God <laughs> for. I love it. Yeah, that's a, whenever I, whenever I can go, whenever, cause like holidays fall, right. I'm like, Hey, we don't have class that day. I'm gone. You know, there's lots of long weekends. Um, since I teach at a university, they usually have like, you have classes twice a week. So all my classes get put on Tuesdays and Thursdays the last couple of years. And this year, like every year is different, but lately it's been a lot of Tuesday, Thursday. So I can literally, I, I will leave from work, drive straight to the airport Thursday afternoon, fly someplace. And then there's been times where we'll fly back, get dropped off and I'll drive straight from the airport right to teach a class on Tuesday. Wow. I love it. That's a, uh, that's good dedication. <laughs> Yeah, so there's those. And then, you know, like you always have your fall breaks, your spring breaks, your winter breaks, summer. So we, we take advantage of those as much as we can. Amazing. Very cool. Yeah. And then my, and then we also split it up because it's not just me that does, like my wife has channels and she does videos too. And she'll go travel with her friends. So like, if I know, like, I know like February's that's hardcore teaching month. Yeah. Cause I'm not going to be going anywhere. So she'll go, that's when she's going to go to Tucson and she's going to go where else she, I think she's going down to Florida then too. Um, like she'll film stuff. And so we'll have multiple channels. Like we have our main Walter's World channel, but then we have a Walter's World Each channel, which is about food around the world. And then we've got Professor Walters versus the business education one. And then we have Walter's World Shorts, which is 
like when we review hotels and you see my wife more on that one and like the vertical videos, you know, like the TikTok kind of stuff that that's on there. And my son has his own channel. So there's all different stuff where we're kind of putting together and that it can work. And so we're always exploring new places. So. Wow. That's amazing. That's really cool. We'll make sure that there's links for all of that type of stuff in the show notes. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah, I I did also want to follow up just for anyone listening. Where's like the first place they should go to, to check out all, all of your material. So you can go to waltersworld.com, W-O-L-T-E-R-S, world.com. That's our main, that's our website. And on there we have blogs. So if you don't want to hear my beautiful voice in the YouTube's the videos, you can read about them there. Um, or just go on YouTube and find us at Walters World. And the easiest thing, you might just put in the don'ts of going to Germany, the don'ts of seeing the US. You'll see Walters World pop up in your first year search and click on one of our videos there and learn more. So uh, you'll see a guy, a, a bald guy with a with a ponytail and a, and a beard the round head that'll be talking to help you travel better. Amazing. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for this conversation today. It's been really awesome getting to chat with you. Thanks, Mark. Well, thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. We've It's been a pleasure. All right. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you want more, make sure to check out the World Wanderers Insider available on Patreon at patreon.com slash the world wanderers. For show notes, head over to the world wanderers.com. Find us on social media at the World Wanderers Podcast and join the private Facebook community at World Wanderers, a community for travelers. You can always get in touch with us at info at theworldwanderers.com. And if you enjoy the show, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. It really helps us find new listeners. See you next time.